And welcome everybody to our July PFA Network Coffee Chat. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we are recording, um, again, like I said, to um, our YouTube. Um, and then I do have a live transcript available if you need it. Um, <laughs> down at the bottom of your screen, um, there is CC if you need live transcript, and um, it'll um, have the transcript there for you. These are our agreements we like to go through before each meeting. Um, we like to practice active and empathetic listening and sharing. We want this to be a safe space for you all and for um, the folks presenting. So we want to challenge the idea. If an idea is challenged, uh, we don't want to challenge the person. Be both teachers and learners. We want to take the space we need, but also make space for others. Uh, the stories that we hear stay, um, but the lessons you learn from those stories will leave. We use I statements, one person speaks at a time, and we want to be here and present now. And welcome, everybody. Um, we'll do our little intro, uh, our introduction, um, and we can go round table here. Uh, so let us know your name, where you're calling in from, and are you an early bird or a night owl? Uh, so I'll get us started. I'm Laura Jackson. I'm the director of um, community at PFCC Partners. I am located in Eugene, Oregon. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I feel like I switch back and forth a lot. Currently, I'm in my night owl phase. <laughs> I'm a night owl at the moment. So um, that is me. Let me go down my list here. Um, Chris. Are you able to come off mute? Oh, no audio. Ah, early bird. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, how about Abby? Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. So I'm Abby Sprague. I am in Delafield, Wisconsin, and I was formerly a night owl, but since having kids, I am an early bird. Hmm. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't find my mute. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, let's see. Eileen. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Eileen Ford, and I am calling in from Casper, Wyoming. I work with a nonprofit who uh, works with parents of little ones who have um, various illnesses and try to connect them with resources. So that's why I'm popping on is to learn more about um, this and see if it's something that I could connect my families with. And in the summertime, I think I'm more of an early bird when the sun is out earlier, um, but go into hibernation mode a little bit more <laughs> in the winter time. I understand that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Italia. Hello, everyone. I am Italia Falecco from Hollywood, Florida, Jody Major Children's Hospital. And I am actually both. <laughs> I got up early to run and I stay a little late sometimes doing stuff. Nice. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit of both, too. <laughs> Uh, Lance. I'm Lance. I'm in Los Angeles, and I always refer to myself as a morning person wannabe. I, I love getting up early, um, hearing the birds, drinking my coffee and quiet, but it never seems to work like that, or at least my body doesn't doesn't like it, even though I <laughs> the rest of me does. I do yeah. have an alarm clock that goes off at 630 every morning. Uh, he just turned two. So <laughs> I'm, I'm a morning person from that sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining. Those, yeah, those two-year-olds, they they'd be a good, a good alarm. <laughs> uh, Monica. Hi everyone. My name is Monica De La Cruz. I'm from Los Angeles, and I am a night owl. So I love. Um, I actually like 
hiking at night sometimes. Ooh. So it's like a different perspective, kind of like the mystery of what's in the trees. <laughs> um, uh, so when when I saw that picture, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I am you know. <laughs> <laughs> it is very pretty. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Uh, Tiffany. Hi, I'm Tiffany. I am in Campbellsport, Wisconsin, and I am a night owl who married an early bird, and my <laughs> child is an early bird, so I am now an early bird as well. <laughs> Forced early bird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, oh, we do have two Abbeys. Um, other Abby. <laughs> I don't remember which one spoke earlier. Um, we can't hear you, Abby. There might be something with your audio. Yeah, <laughs> you can add into the chat. Uh, feel free to add your intros into the chat. Uh, Libby. Good morning, everybody. I'm Libby Hoy. I'm the founder and CEO of PFCC Partners, and I'm happy to be on here with all of you today. Um, I've been thinking about this, Laura, since everybody's been going around, and some people have said both. I'm going to say neither. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a night owl, but I find myself exhausted by 10. <laughs> so I don't think that's really a night owl anymore. So yeah, maybe... Um, at my best during the day. <laughs> and I apologize, I'm gonna stay off camera because I just finished my workout. <laughs> nice. You had to get up early for that, probably. Yes, <laughs> earlier than I, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Aaron. Hi, I am Aaron Gonzalez. I'm talking to you today from Seattle, Washington, and I am solidly a night owl. I have tried i have wished i have uh tried to fake it till you make it and try to make myself a morning uh an early bird but i've accepted now after many decades i just that's just not my thing so you're not going to find me working out uh, before <laughs> 7 30 in the morning that's for sure despite despite the kids i i can't do it so i embrace my night owl status Good, good. Yeah, embrace it. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Uh, Deb. Hi, I'm uh, Deb Collier, and I am located in Northern California. Um, I am naturally a night owl, but I'm on way too many um, East Coast and European calls in the morning. So, <laughs> and, and I agree, Erin, I'm not going to be exercising first thing in the morning, but I, I try to get it in sometime. Good. Nice. Thank you. And Ziba? <clears throat> Ziba and I'm from New Jersey. I am, uh, earlier I used to be night owl, uh, but I have two little ones. So I try to wake up late, but uh, it's very hard. So I I think it's, uh, I, I have become early owl, not, not, not the night owl, <laughs> the early bird. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Ziba. And uh, Linda? Hey, everybody. I'm Linda Starnes. I'm in the Orlando, Florida area. And um, what do you call somebody who wakes up at about three every night? <laughs> Is that really, the night really owl? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um, I, I always get up early regardless, but um, I still tend to wake up in the middle of the night, too. <laughs> so a little of both. I feel your pain, Linda. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's funny. Well, thank you Linda thanks for joining us okay I want to check my list here I know I had a few people pop in and out let's see but I think we've got everybody did I miss anybody I don't think so. All right. We'll go ahead and keep moving forward. Uh, we do have a new PFA Network member profile questionnaire. You've probably seen it in uh, your inboxes. And um, we, uh, a lot of you have, <clears throat> excuse me, filled this out before. Um, we changed 
uh, programs for it. So um, we revamped it and added a couple more um, questions to it to get to know you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but this is so we can learn a little bit more about you and your experiences as patient family advisor, patient family partner. Um, and um, we can also get you connected to some engagement opportunities that um, really speak to what you, um, to speak to your experiences. So um, we do like getting those folks connected um, who have those specific experiences that the organizations come to us um, and uh, look for. So I'm gonna add the link. If you have not filled it out, um, we highly recommend um, you fill it out and Laura, if I could jump in while you're grabbing the link, um, the, the other benefit of this, folks, is that we can really speak to who our members are um, and a more collective um, sort of consensus messaging, if you will, from our um, from our community. And that's that's really becoming quite important. And we really want to ensure that all of you have voice in that consensus sort of messaging. So again, the more that we understand about who's in the community and what um, are the priorities of our community members, the more effectively we can um, make those matches for um, and, and really drive the field forward in its entirety. So um, we appreciate you taking about, I don't know, what is it, Laura, five, 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, probably to, not. To complete that, so thank you. Yes, thank you. And if you have filled it out in the past, um, before this new one came out, you are more than welcome to fill it out again. Like I said, we kind of revamped the, uh, some of the questions, so there's new things to add in there. Um, and so we will just kind of update the profile that we have for you. So don't worry about filling it out multiple times if you feel like you would like to do that. Um, we welcome that. Um, I did put the link in the chat there for you, so you can head on over after this um, to fill out the survey. And do we have any questions while we're here? All right. Well, with that, I think that leads us straight into our coffee chat. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I would like to introduce um, Deb Collier, Aaron Gonzalez, and Ziba Singh. And they are going to talk to us today all about digital health solutions and helping you and your children manage big emotions. So I will pass it off to you and you can take it away. Thank you, Laura. Um, this is Deb Collier. I'm wondering, Desiree came in. Do you want her to go through the introduction? first or? Sure. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good morning. How are you? Sorry, I hopped on late. Um, I'm assuming we're just introducing who we are and where we're from. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'm Desiree Thomas. I'm a nurse by background. I work for Providence St. Joseph Hospital in Orange, and I am currently the executive director of our emergency department of our critical care units and also our behavioral health. So happy to be here. And I have a big passion for patient family-centered care. Oh, thank you for joining us today. Great. Well, yes, thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit about um, uh, some digital health solutions to hopefully help you and um, your children or those that you work with manage big emotions. And so I'm uh, president of Patient Advocates and Research. You can just call me Deb or Deborah either way. Um, and I've been uh, working with Maxis Health, uh, as has Aaron. So I think, um, Ziba, why don't you go next? And then we'll introduce Aaron and get going. Okay, thank you so much, uh, PFA families, for allowing us to be a part of this event. Uh, my name is Ziba, and I'm a product owner at Maxis Health. Um, so, Erin, you can go next. Great. Um, hi, I'm Erin Gonzalez. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I am um, a consultant for Maxis Health. And I'm going to start us out here. I think, Deb, is that okay? I'll just go yes. ahead. Um, Great. So uh, I think 
everybody on this call can probably relate to uh, and agree with the fact that child behavior problems and big emotions create a lot of stress and challenge. They're completely normal in childhood and also completely frustrating and difficult. Um, we do know that, uh, you know, in the inconveniences of early child behavior problems can develop into bigger problems for families um, when families don't get the support they need, like kids having trouble building friendships, succeeding in the classroom, feeling confident about themselves. And for parents, it can start to feel very isolating when your child is having um, difficult behavior. It feels like you can't enjoy the same activities that other families seem to be having an easy time enjoying. Uh, there's more stress and conflict between co-parents, and it can certainly take a toll on parent mental health over time, as well as just burden to the family and trying to find services. Uh, we also know, and I'm sure folks on this call can relate to um, having a very hard time finding treatment resources when you feel like your child's behavior is really becoming a problem. All right, next slide, please. Uh, for many, many um, families in the US, nearly a quarter uh, of families, child behavior becomes extra complicated when there's a, a, a clinical or a mental health or developmental concern that's contributing. So we know nearly 10% of US children are diagnosed with ADHD. Um, though many are offered medication, very few receive any type of behavioral supports or services. Um, autism is now diagnosed at a rate of one out of 36 children and the rate of anxiety disorder in children around the world, uh, but particularly in the US is rising. It's increasingly common. And of course, any of these types of concerns are going to make emotions even bigger and more unpredictable and difficult to manage. Uh, and parents are often looking for better understanding of what's going on for their child and of course resources so that they can help their kids become successful and prevent possible long-term mental health problems for their child and family. Next, please. All right, so um, we're gonna invite folks in the chat if you would like to you know, share some of the things that you would like your kids to learn about big feelings and emotions. And uh, if you have young kids, this may be a topic that's on your mind currently. If you have older kids, maybe, you know, thinking back to when your kids were elementary age, what did you want them to know and understand about their feelings? And also, how do kids learn about feelings? Right? Do we, I'm sure we've all tried to just tell our kids and teach our kids about feelings. Uh, that's hard. It's hard for that to sink in and stick, right? So we need more real world ways to help kids learn about their emotions. I'm keeping an eye on the chat here. We got one that said that big feelings are okay and also resources to help them manage big feelings. Uh, wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so we want our kids to not be afraid of their feelings. We want them to know that we as adults can handle their feelings. We're not gonna panic and freak out. We'll be there with them. We want them to know that there's help that they can get when they feel they need it or when they feel they're out of control. Let's see, have a lot of tools for to use when having big feelings, right? So giving kids a sense of personal control and efficacy. To be able to trust parents in talking about emotions. And as we all know, when your child is having a big negative emotion, the urge as a parent is to try to stop that emotion from happening. Just quelch it immediately, right? And, and that doesn't really build trust uh, for kids knowing that we can handle their feelings and help them understand and handle their feelings. Great, I love what everyone said. Let's go head on to the next one. Uh, so what can we do? Um, I think we we all can agree with the goal of helping kids learn early in life. We don't want to wait until the teenage years when they definitely don't want to hear from us and receive coaching from us. 
we want to start early when we possibly can. And sometimes as parents, we need help with that. What are we supposed to do? <laughs> we, we never received the manual when we brought our baby home from the hospital, right? And now we've got to figure out how to help them learn. I saw one more comment teaching about feelings, having a child on the spectrum, um, children's books, reading with your child and using those for conversations. Yes, actually, that does tie into what we're talking about, having uh, examples and real world practice, right? Not just saying, do this when you have a big feeling, but helping them see how to use it. Love that. Uh, next, please. Um, also, you know, we welcome in the chat people sharing their experiences when you do ask for help, whether that's from your child's doctor, whether it's from a mental health professional, uh, whether it's from a website, uh, you get a lot of conflicting advice, right? Uh, a lot of things are recommended. It's hard to know, is it evidence-based or not? Uh, is this actually going to be worth my time and money? And where do I find it, right? Um, so I imagine folks on here can relate to having difficulty figuring out where to begin and where to find those resources. And if we go to the next slide, yeah, some of these do have a really solid evidence base for disruptive behaviors and ADHD and other challenging behaviors in childhood. Some of them don't really have a solid evidence base. And so this uh, can really lead families to um, sink a lot of time and resource into things that unfortunately aren't going to be game changing for them. All right, next, please. I will turn it over to Ziba here. Thank you, Erin. Um, so, uh, Maxis Health, it's a digital health company that focuses on providing the personalized care for patients to manage the chronic illness. So our main objectives are, so we are building a, developing a product called Bloom for pediatric population that is a precision mental health platform. So we have three main objectives uh, to build this, develop this product. So number one, deliver the personalized care at early age. Number two, provide intervention, not just for child, but for parents as well to effectively manage the symptoms. As Erin mentioned that we sometimes aggravate the situation and it go out of control. And number three, clinicians can monitor their patients and set goals to improve the quality of life. So let's learn more about Bloom. So Bloom comprises of three main components. Number one, wearable, that will capture the physiological signals from child. Number two, it has an AI-assisted program that will predict anxiety and notify the parent. And number three, the intervention programs for child and parent to manage the mental health. So Bloom app that will continuously monitor your physiological signals for your child will not only help the child, but also it will help the parent to identify the triggers and intervene the child with help of a parent coping program. Along with that, there will be digital health diary that will help parents to prevent the recall bias. And then the evening session of child intervention program will not just help child to learn the techniques, but the breathing exercise that will help them to sleep better. I think it's the most of the parents do struggle with their child sleep. So let's work together to our vision for developing this product. And let's take Ellie and her family here, for example. A five-year-old Ellie, an adorable girl who has developed dislikes for school and throw tantrums frequently. Her parents found it difficult to comprehend the cause behind her behavior and determine the triggers for the sudden outburst. But due to societal stigma, uh, the parents resisted from seeking professional help and feared that their child might be labeled. So one day, her parents came across Bloom. Ellie became thrilled when she saw the princess wrist wearable. And mom, on the other hand, installed an app called Bloom. Through the app, they can track Ellie's behavior and identify the triggers. Isn't it cool? Like if as a parent, we come to know, okay, our child is getting any kind of anxiety and we can 
intervene them before they go into outbursts. So with Bloom, the AI model is created a personalized treatment plan that will alert her parents whenever she goes on the verge of any episode. So as they become more informed and confident about Ellie's situation, they decided to seek professional help and discover that Ellie was, uh, was diagnosed with ADHD and co-occurring anxiety disorder. With regular usage of Bloom, Ellie was able to self-manage her anxiety and became more confident and adaptive to the surroundings. So it not only helped parents, but also Ellie to identify her feelings and manage them in a constructive way. And it not only just improved their quality of life, but also helped Ellie to be much more adaptive to her surroundings. So this is a small vision what we have for our product Bloom. So now I would like to hand it to Deb to give you more details about the product. Great, thank you, Ziba. So um, yes, as Ziba said, that's the vision for what Bloom will do, but it is not live yet, right? It's not. Uh, it takes a long time to develop a product that has so many different pieces put together. So as you can see from the left side, we had um, help from uh, PFCC partners in uh, filling out surveys. And I don't know if any of you filled them out or not. If you did, please let us know in chat. And thank you very much. Um, because we wanted to make sure from the beginning, we understood and, and continue to understand what the issues are that families are facing. And um, so that survey helped a lot. In the meantime, there was research that was going on, both for the, on the digital technology side, the behavioral side, and then other uh, things that were available or gaps that, that existed. Um, then Maxis Health has been working with academic partners like Aaron and others. Um, to make sure that we're building tools that actually work and fit in with things like cognitive um, behavior, behavioral therapy and things like that. Um, and so right now where we are, as you can see from this arrow, um, there's an observational study that's um, going to be going on, I believe, next month. And Ziba can tell us a little more about that if you have any questions. That observational study isn't about the whole product, it's about the technology side of it to make sure that it is actually able to accurately um, record and log uh, the behavioral episodes that children may be having when they're having them. So that component obviously is very important as well as the things like the parent coping program and the child intervention program that are part of this. Um, so with that observational study and making sure that the digital technology works, then they'll be building the whole prototype to bring uh, the programs and thing in, things in. And then of course we wanna test that and get feedback as well. There is a plan as you see here for FDA approval of Bloom so that um, we're families and, and uh, therapists and clinicians can be assured that it actually does what it says it does. And that's the whole idea. And then the product will launch after FDA approval. So we're um, kind of planning or predicting that the product will be available in 2024. Um, so that's, we wanted to just kind of not only tell you about it, but also to get your input. So we'd like to make sure that we understand the behaviors and triggers for children. Um, we need you to tell us what your needs are and how this would actually work in your lives in a daily basis, um, giving feedback as the product develops and uh, what we need to improve on it. And then also to build a product that can actually deliver value to you. Sorry, I have two screens, so that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm going back and forth. So now it, it really is your turn. We'd like to hear from you. So feel free to either put in the chat or um, go ahead and, and uh, unmute yourselves and talk to us about what you think about this approach. Do you think this will actually work? Would it be helpful? How would you use it? 
um, what are other challenges or unmet needs that we need to be sure in thinking about and maybe other ideas that you may have as well. So does anyone, and I'm going to try to go to chat now. It, it's uh, always difficult. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but I'm going to put it over here. No, we can't see it. No, good. Okay. <laughs> um, so would anyone like to start us off? Is there something... Um, what do you think about this approach, the idea of having a, a digital uh, watch at this point that the child would wear that would be able to monitor their um, biological or biophysical um, situations and alert you as a parent or a, a provider, because parents can have the ability to let providers know as well, that um, your child is, is beginning to have an episode so that you could react to that. Does that sound like something that could be useful? And I'm going to mute now that the yard people are here. <laughs> Just from a child's perspective, if, if the child wears this at school, how would you uh, uh, advise them to explain this to another child that's not wearing this device? Uh, thank you. For, okay, so I'll just go ahead and answer that question. Thank you, Monica, for asking that question, and it's a really good question. So the device which we are, the wearable which I'm talking about, that we will be building, uh, it will be just like a kind of a Fitbit or Apple Watch or any other wrist band, wrist watch. So a child, I have seen kids. So this, what we are trying to do is, it's mainly useful to capture their physiological signals. Uh, and we need to have a training for the teacher as well so that they understand that uh, the, she, she needs to have that app. And it really depends on the parent for how long will you like a child to wear it. When it's come to the kids, so it will be a cool, uh, what we are trying to make, build is something which is cool to be worn and they should be, they shouldn't resist on wearing it. So maybe some good Disney character watch or something like that. So it might not be just with uh, the wires or something which the child will be hesitant in wearing it, but something which is cool for them to at least show them to their friends. Thank I hope you. I answer you. Yes, thank you. Thanks. And uh, Deb, do you mind if you just, um, I think I'm still viewing the, your screen. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks. Is there any other questions? We would be happy to have I your see, feedback. I see that Tiffany said um, you would love to, your child to have a variety of tools to use when he's having big feelings. Um, can you maybe share a little bit more, Tiffany? Is Tiffany still with us? Might have hopped off. Looks like she had to hop Looks off. Like she had to hop <laughs> off. Okay. Um, to be able to trust parents talking about emotions, Italia, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Does this get into the stigma part that we were talking about? Sorry, I couldn't find my um, my mic. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about it. I'm a psychotherapist by training. I'm not quite sure. I, uh, I, I don't know quite sure how they can measure the benefits. Um, I'm not there fully. Um, I don't know, anything that is tracked by a device. Um, I'm not quite sure how I find it right now helpful. Uh, there's where I'm at right now. That's what I'm look, okay. listening to okay. others. Okay. So not sure how a, a device can track something like that. Ziba, could you go into maybe a little more um, detail about how the wearable will work? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so 
uh, the thing is the device is just to capture the heart rate. So what we are capturing with the device is the heart rate. Like in Apple Watch, we do monitor the heart rate. We do have the accelerometer data, which monitors the movement of a child, right? So we do have a skin temperature. So it's just to capture all those things. But then when we have all that data, it will be fed to our uh, machine learning model, which is an AI model, uh, which we have built. And then that model will be able to predict and alert the parent whenever a child is about to have any meltdown or any kind of tantrum or might be going into any emotion uh, distress situation. So in that scenario, what will happen is even if a child is not closer to the parent, but maybe a certain race, um, I'm sorry, you were saying something? Oh, I, I can I just ask a question? Say, I'm sorry, this device is going to catch you. One thing is movement. What was the first thing that you said? Uh, the heart rate. Is oh, the heart six. rate. Okay, the heart yeah. rate movement and what else? Uh, heart rate movement, uh, accelerometer, and electrodermal activity, like skin, skin uh, activity. Okay. Yeah. And how do we know? if that is not a response to a physiological issue rather than emotional, uh, is the device able to tell us, oh, this is the heart, the heart rate is related to, I don't know, something physiological. Uh, I'm curious. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad that you are curious and I'm happy to answer all your questions. So that will not be the watch that will alert you, okay? So we, will ha we have a Bloom app that will alert the parent. So let's take an example, like if you get a heart rate of 110, right? And then they see that some accelerometer data, all that numbers, that numbers will go into our model, the machine learning model, the AI model, and then it will predict the meaningful data. So whatever the data is collected, the number data will be turned into a meaningful information through our uh, model. And then, that will alert the parent whenever they see any un, uh, unusual behavior, or any uh, like uh, unusual heart rate or any other activity that is being uh, carried by the uh, by the child. So that will alert the parent. Not watch will not alert anything to the child. It's just to capture their signals or uh, physiological signals, what we call. So it will be the app which will uh, send an alert to the parent. On the app, they will receive an alert. And that's and part of, sorry, that's part of where the observational study is coming in um, that's happening next month to make sure that the what they're doing is they're training the model um, with the data that will come in from the children wearing the device. Yes. And the, the main thing is that it will be personalized to a specific child. Right, so what we will be doing is for a few couple of weeks, whenever a child will wear the watch, okay, for first few weeks, we will just, the model will just keep learning from the child's signal, physiological signal. And then that model will be trained specially for that child. So it will be personalized model for that specific child. So then models will learn, okay, this is the pattern what usually occurs when a child is crying. This is a pattern what usually occur when a child has an anxiety situation. So that's how the model will learn. And that's how the alert will be sent to the parent accordingly. So I, this is Linda Starnes and I, I just, I'm, I'm listening to this and, and under, you know, taking in the information and, and it is, it's pretty heady stuff that y'all are working on. So kudos for, for coming up with this, but I think the critical point is going to be how that information is interpreted by whomever is receiving it and what all their next steps are going to be in regard to that information coming in and the amount of training, uh, you know, parent and teacher training um, mm -hmm. to, to how to best then look at the child themselves and determine, oh, what do I need to do for, you know, supporting them, 
uh, de-escalation activities, whatever. And, and, and is this read correct? And, or what's going on situationally that needs to be um, that the, in the environment to, to be changed to support that child so that it doesn't escalate further. It's just, there's a lot of interesting, I think, parent training that would need to go on and teacher training that's going to need to go on to then take that information and use it well as, and, and they're the ones that best know their child, but to use it well so that they can, can um, support their child. I yeah. understand that this model is going to go to machine learning. Um, my husband works with machine learning. I don't understand it fully, but I kind of get it. Uh, it's a kind of program. But I, what I don't understand is how a pattern that was picked up at a certain time and then put together through machine learning, which I know what it is, I just can't verbalize it in, in, in a way that you know I sound uh, knowledgeable. Uh, the triggers though, what if the triggers, I don't, uh, the triggers, the, whatever trigger, the heart rate, all those factors that you mentioned, can one response apply to every time the child reaches that heart rate, that blah, blah, blah? Uh, is there one response? The human part is missing. Okay. So, uh, no, uh, we definitely take care of human because see a human aspect in here. So when we will send an alert, right? So we will ask the parent. So parent input is really important for us to save certain patterns. So suppose, let's take an example. If we see one, 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 right? As a pattern, when a child gets anxious, okay? So we will notify the parent saying that, okay, look like your child is getting anxious. Is that right? So parent, if they say yes, then that pattern will be stored, okay? But if they say no, my child is not, then it will not store. So parent input is really important in every aspect. So it's not that the model will learn by itself. It will be helpful with the parent input as well. And then we have a parent, so every aspect will get triggered on one sentence if, uh, if it's validated by the parent. And then we have Erin who created a parent coping program for us. So I think Erin would like to chime in some things. So Erin, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna um, chime in that the part for me that as a psychologist that I think um, really goes beyond what we, we currently have available is the parent coping app, which uses best practices from parent behavior management training and cognitive behavioral therapy to walk the parent through what to do next in that moment. So they could, the parent can also open the app and say, help me, my child's freaking out. And uh, this app will learn over time the things that work best for that child and family. Because there are some kids when they're having a meltdown who want to be soothed and are open to being soothed. Many other kids like my own kids, don't touch them, they're gonna freak out more, give them space, give them quiet. There also is a huge component of parent self-regulation and co-regulation with the child that is crucial during a meltdown. And so a lot of what the app is doing is walking parents through their own coping plan that the app has helped create for them. So what do they need to do to not explode, fuel the fire, make it worse? So I think the, the parent coping app um, is kind of like a family coach. Uh, and that's where we're bringing in therapeutic strategies to uh, in the moment, be that therapist for the family. Because most therapists, I don't know about you all, I'm not available you know, 24 seven to be able to provide live coaching. It's a wonderful thing, can't do it but an app like this could learn to do what a therapist might do to walk a family through. And I would just add, having said that, the product is not meant to replace therapists or clinicians or teachers or whomever is helping the family. It's meant to augment, basically, and complement the work that's being done. But as Erin said, you can't be there 24-7. Um, the the goal is that the app 
um, and the and the parent coping program and the child intervention program will be there to help along the way and help teach the family and the child what they can do to try to manage and and uh, and take control to empower the child as they're learning to manage these big feelings. I don't know, Ziba, if you want to talk a little bit about the um, child intervention program as well. Yeah, sure. So uh, along with that, because we wanted to cover 36 degree angle for all through for whole families. So we do have parent coping program. We do have child intervention program, which we would recommend parent and child uh, to go uh, during the evening time. So it will have some kind of storyline, uh, video based thing where a child will be trained how to take deep breath or do some kind of breathing techniques or try to um, actually uh, manage the anxiety uh, during an actual real life situations. So those training uh, will be very helpful and eventually it will become their second nature. So just to get uh, takes one step back, like we have done two years of research just coming up to this platform because the initial stage when we started with that, we started with a concept where we wanted uh, the little minds, like when we start training them, how it will impact when they grow up. So uh, so that's how we started. Like there, we have seen that there are so many, uh, the surveys and all those numbers for suicidal incidents has increased after uh, this pandemic. And then what actually triggered was it's not just few years or few months or kind of an instant thing where a person decides to take that action, but it is a kind of a prolonged illness, which they had it from the past, but was not being identified. So that's why we are trying to get hold at the early age where child's brain can be trained, how to manage and cope up with their these kind of emotions, uh, big feelings, especially. So uh, really hoping that the whole package like FAM, uh, parent coping program and child intervention program will help them how to manage their, uh, yeah, cope up with their stress and big feelings. Yeah, thanks. thanks. And Linda, you mentioned in the chat earlier about teach about feelings as a parent um, <clears throat> that you would gravitate toward children's books. And that's actually a part of what the child intervention program is about, is an app that they can watch, but it has stories and it has animation um, in it. So that's what's being built right now. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that or Ziba, did you wanna add anything? Yeah, so just to add on that, uh, uh, it will be a situational based story. So suppose my child has anxiety going into uh, new places, new location. So the stories will be more inclined towards that. So it will be customized and personalized for that particular child so that he knows, okay, if this is what happened in the story. And if I'm in the real situation, how I can deal with that. So that will give a kind of a training for the child to be up there in the real world scenarios. Yeah. We do have a question in the chat from Abby. Um, she sees a, a ton of value in the app that you're explaining. Um, is that available for parents who maybe don't want to use the device and just want to use the app? Or is what you're talking about kind of more that supplemental aspect? It's a great question. Um, so I think I would, uh, at this point of time, uh, it's still a club together, but uh, you never know. It might just come up with the, just a standalone app. It does have a lot of potential in that to be a standalone app. I think it's something that you, you should consider because I see so much value. I, just as a parent trying to kind of digest all of this, I think it sounds cool. I have personal feelings of like being a little bit reluctant to put the device on my child and track things from that standpoint, partially because, and, and, and I, I, I'm having this exact scenario right now with one of my children and 
trying to gather a ton of resources to figure out how do we, how can we best support him and manage him through this? Um, but I don't seem to struggle with knowing the triggers. I know the tr triggers quite well, maybe too well even. Um, so I can see it happening before it starts, but I really struggle with what do I do next? So it would just be interesting to know as you're maybe, you know, reaching out to parent populations and polling and getting data and information, what percentage of parents out there feel confident in understanding the triggers? Like what, what is the problem you're trying to solve? For me, the problem I'm trying to solve is what do I do next when we're in, you know, when we're escalating? I think in definitely in your situation, it will be parent coping program, which will uh, help you throughout this journey because it will, so it will be personalized just for you. Uh, it will give you like, what are the things that you are currently facing in real time? And I, I think it's a great suggestion. I would definitely take as a great feedback from you and uh, maybe Maybe you never know, we can just uh, say, okay, you can utilize it as just a standalone app, so you don't need the wearable. Yeah, I see people asking about the app and just, you know, how, how would the app work? How, how does this um, dovetail with parent instincts and, and be personalized enough? And, um, I can speak as a mother of two that when you try to come up with a game plan or follow instincts in the moment, uh, sometimes they backfire, especially if you're coming at it from a place of being dysregulated and overwhelmed yourself. So that the app is actually to help you create your game plan ahead of time based on patterns for your child over time. It tracks patterns, uh, what happens for your child during meltdowns, what helps, what makes it worse so that when you're in the crisis moment the app is there to give you your own best practices so uh, it'll it, during not crisis moments the app has modules that you can walk through to practice some new skills to decide if something works for you or not to there's the cognitive piece about examining the role of your thoughts in a crisis and how to help yourself um, harness those those useful thoughts uh, rather than the hot thoughts. So it's going to be, uh, it is um, personalized to what works for that family. Certainly, if you wanted to in the moment, abandon it and go on a different instinct, that's great. The app will then track and debrief. What did you do? What worked? How do we want to fit what, what just was successful into the next round of the, of the plan for your family? Thank you. Aaron. Oh, and I see a I see a question about foster families. So this is actually ideal, you know, for families where a caregiver is stepping in. You've got foster families, you've got kinship caregivers who are in stepping in. Maybe it's even a family where a bio parent is raising the child, but a grandparent is coming in for some portion of the day. This this is great because you don't have to have seven years of experience with that particular child to use this adaptive plan. It will learn with you as you manage crises for the child and kind of shortcut the process of becoming an expert in your child. It's lending professional advice to your parenting instincts and perspective. So um, it hasn't been tested with foster parents, but that is really a great point and idea. I think I think that it would be ideally situated for foster caregiving scenarios. Also great if you have different caregivers, different generations, different caregiving settings to get everybody on the same page. I know I work with multi generational households where grandparents absolutely cannot ignore certain behaviors that parents say just don't react to that so this can help everybody have one game plan including daycare setting school setting home setting you can kind of sync up with this app yeah i agree with that i think another interesting niche might be um inpatient kiddos right so um i volunteer with children's wisconsin and there are kids that 
spend a lot of time in hospital settings and you can only imagine the anxiety and trauma and all of the the things that come along with that when you've got different nurses and doctors. I mean, that would be a whole different probably business model and and vision rollout because it would have to be hospital staff kind of trained to monitor these types of things. But that could, that could really um, be an interesting place where this could add value down the road too. And just to add on what Erin said, uh, so we do have a kind of a digital health diary and we have various dashboards which you can view. Look, supposedly you are not with the child and you have a caregiver who's looking for your child. So at the end of the day, you will know what reports, how much hours the child had that uh, anxiety situation, how much time the child was uh, having uh, excited or was playing around or doing all those things. So, so you will have a complete holistic view of a child's stay, or maybe if you wanted to check the reports on daily basis, monthly basis, or yearly basis. And that can be shared with the clinicians as well. Because clinicians, you, you, you as a parent, you see a clinician after three months or six months. So we miss on certain crucial aspects of a child's life. And then when we are uh, with doctor, we have a limited time. But with this, if you share the reports with them, they know like, okay, these were the things we are kind be red flag and these were the incidents so that the whatever the plan or treatment uh, can be changed accordingly so it can also supplement in that area so you don't have to remember all those incidents yeah so just trying to make everybody's life simple and <laughs> I know as you always resist giving a drug or medication to a child. But if there's something that you can just put it on a child's hand, arm, or maybe a patch or something, which you just know that it will monitor the signal and you are getting a kind of a, all data for your child and all information about the child, how this changing and what are the triggers that usually make your child anxious. So I, I think it will be a great um, product which can be included in your personal life as a daily routine because we don't want to overwhelm the parents with this. So something which can help them to manage their and improve the quality of their life. So that's what our main goal is. Right. And since we're getting close to the end, I know, Laura, I will, I'll give it back to you, but we are very interested in continuing to hear your comments. So if you'd like to continue uh, with us, you can go to Maxis Health for more information. Um, and then we've also put the emails for Ziba and myself um, there. So, and, and these, like we said, will be recorded and we'll be happy to share the slides as well, if that's useful. Any other comments? Laura, I'll let you take it back. Thank you very much for your involvement here. We, you had some really good feedback and we really appreciate it. Yeah, great questions from everybody. I'm just adding your emails in the chat here. Okay. Um, right. right, there was one question that came to me directly asking about do we want volunteers for the observational study? The observational study right now is just about the de wearable device and collecting the data and making sure that it's accurate. That's being done in one location in the Northeast. And so I think we've got that taken care of. Is that right, Ziba? Yeah, that's right. But uh, uh, our I would be happy to connect with that parent uh, if they can reach out to me directly. Uh, so mm -hmm. I can get connected and get more understanding. But thank right. you. So, really appreciate so, that. Please let uh, Ziba know. And my um, address is actually different. So I'm putting it in. Uh, Deborah is spelled D E B O R A H. Oops, I missed the H. <laughs> no, that's okay. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today and for providing great input and awesome questions for um, our team here. So we really appreciate it. Um, if anybody has a topic or a project that you'd like to share 
with the PFA network, um, feel free to fill out the interest form <clears throat> or um, email me. I will let you know. Um, and we'll get you set up to do, <clears throat> excuse me, a coffee chat in the future. And there's my email there. Um, I'll hang out for a couple of minutes if anybody has any questions. If not, we will see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Again. Appreciate the information. Thank you. Happy summer to everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>